That's a really bad idea. But you can be the thing that's dynamically mediating between them. And that's what he's doing. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. That's no easy thing to do, I would think. You know, it's like you're thrown in prison and now the jailer likes you. Now, how exactly are you going to manage that? It's a good thing to think about because you might think, well, if you were really in dire straits, how is it that you should conduct yourself so that you have the highest probability of having things work out? And it's not saying, well, Joseph took over the thumbscrew, you know, and started using that on the other prisoners. That, that's not the indication here at all. It's that he's doing something, he's acting like a person who isn't a prisoner. Even though he's in the prison, just like he was acting like someone who wasn't a slave when he was a slave. And so, it makes you wonder who you can be, despite the fact that other people think that you're whatever you appear to be. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So it's a repeat. It's a repeat of exactly what happened when he was the slave of the Pharaoh, except it's one rung deeper into hell, so to speak, right? So it's slave Pharaoh, and here it's prisoner, jail, master, but it doesn't matter. The same thing happens. So now Joseph is in prison and the Pharaoh has a fit one day of peak and throws the chief of his butlers into prison and the chief of his bakers. And they have a dream, each of them. And uh, Joseph interprets the dreams, which seems to be something that he can do. And uh, he tells the butler that his dream means that Pharaoh is going to forgive him and put him back in his position. And he tells the baker that the Pharaoh isn't going to <laughs> forgive him and that he's going to take off his head and hang him in a tree, which is a rather rough dream, but that is what, <laughs> that's what happens. So anyways, the, the baker or the butler goes free and Joseph says, look, you know, maybe you could just keep in mind the fact that I did you a bit of a favor here and told you something that was accurate, but the, the chief didn't really remember once he, once he was freed interpreting dreams in prison. And so, now the Pharaoh has a dream. And he actually has two dreams, so it's another one of those doubled motifs. So, the idea is these are really important dreams because they came in a pair. And behold, there came out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat flesh, so cattle. And they fed the meadow, meadow. And behold, seven other cattle came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, starving, and stood by the other cows on the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat. So Pharaoh awoke. Hey, fair enough, it's a pretty nasty dream. And then he has another dream to, to hit it home. And he slept and dreamt the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good, and Behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and beheld it was a dream. And then it says a little later. And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. It's interesting, you know, because one of the better theories about dreams is that they're part of the way that the right and left hemisphere communicate, or maybe the non-verbal part of the brain communicates with the verbal brain, verbal part of the brain. And so, the non-verbal part of the brain, which is less differentiated and thinks more globally, is looking for patterns and anomalies in the world, things that don't fit well with the current way of conceptualizing the world, things that make you anxious and uncertain. And those are things you haven't mastered, right? So they don't fit well into your conceptualization of the world by definition, because if you had mastered them, they wouldn't make you anxious and nervous. And so the, the nonverbal parts of your brain are like an alarm system. They're looking around for places where you're probably wrong. And then they put those in images and try to conceptualize them so that you can update your model of reality to take them into account. But that also produces a fair bit of negative emotion, especially at night. And so... So we know that we know if you deprive people of dreams that they go insane very rapidly, animals as well. 
necessary part of mental equilibrium. The way you do that with rats, in case you want to know, is that if you've got rats that you want to drive insane, this is how you do it. <laughs> so you put the rat on a, like a pedestal that's pretty small, and then when he fall, that's surrounded by water, and then when he falls asleep, his nose hits the water, and then he wakes up, and so you can deprive the rat of sleep, and that doesn't, the rats don't respond to that very well after some period of time. So that's one of the ways that that's been discovered. But anyways, the dream does seem to be an update mechanism, and so if, if, if you have a very powerful dream, like a nightmare, especially if it's repeating, it's like something is trying to hammer on the door, that needs to be let in. And often you don't know how to let it in. That's, that's a problem. So, but Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, because he had talked to his, his butler. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and Joseph shaved himself and changed his clothes and came in unto Pharaoh. I guess he didn't want to shock Pharaoh with how people dressed in the prison. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there's none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph said, it's not me. Uh, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. It's, so Jacob isn't taking credit for his ability to interpret dreams. Which also indicates quite interestingly, like there's, there's nothing, the, despite the fact that he's successful and competent, he's not narcissistic. Like, if he happens to have this gift, he regards it as a gift and not as something that you know, redounds to his favor. It's just something that he happens to be able to do. And so that's, that's a hallmark of someone who's got a pretty well put together personality as far as I'm concerned because, you know, people have gifts that they didn't really earn. Those would be your talents, your intelligence, your good looks, if you happen to have good looks, etc. And they're not, there's no sense being all puffed up about that because it's, it's great. It's luck of the draw though. And the proper attitude is, to note that it's luck of the draw and to be grateful for it. It's quite a fine painting, that one. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt, and then there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. So now we see too that Jacob, well, he can interpret dreams, but he's also the sort of person who can look into the future and think, this is sort of what Adam was called on to do when he got kicked out of the Garden of Paradise. Is you're going to be able to conceptualize that even if things are going well now, that that doesn't mean that they're going to go well into the future. And so he's the ant and not the grasshopper, right? In the grasshopper and the ant story. It's like everything's good, but you should wake the hell up and you should test to see how things can go wrong. And you can see if your systems can survive them things going wrong. And which is something that I think we could all hearken to because I think we do a very bad job in the modern world of testing to see if our systems can go wrong. Okay, so the Pharaoh is pretty impressed by this dream interpretation and pretty worried about it. And I guess he's a reasonable person despite the fact that he put Joseph in jail. Uh, I guess he didn't have much choice. Now therefore let Pharaoh look for a man dis discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land. This is what Joseph is saying. And take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And just like that, Joseph is restored to his position. So, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt. And so he comes out of the prison, and he really, in some sense, as far as I'm concerned, he actually occupies a position that's higher than the position of the Pharaoh. It depends on how you look at it, because the Pharaoh has relegated himself to ceremonial status, right? Joseph has all the responsibility, makes all the decisions, so de facto, he's the Pharaoh. He doesn't get the glory, precisely, although he's not doing too bad for himself. And that, there's a lesson in that, too. Um, I wrote these rules for Quora a long time ago, and one of them, I, I've written them into this, some of them into this book you guys got a pamphlet about today. One of the rules that I didn't write about was, um, note, that note that opportunity lurks where responsibility has been abdicated. 
which is really interesting, I think. I mean, I've seen people in their jobs, they say things like, well, my, the guy I work with doesn't do any work. It's like, well, you could do it. I mean, I know there's limits to that, but one of the things you can do at work is make yourself indispensable. I mean, you might get the cane types against you if you do that, but there's something to be said for being indispensable because when people start to be dispensed with, you probably won't be one of them. Or even if you are, then the fact that you're indispensable just means you can go somewhere else and be indispensable there. And that's just as useful. So, it's very, very difficult to permanently put down someone who's really good at doing things. Because they can just go off and do them somewhere else. And one of the ways that you get like that is to take responsibility when someone else is failing to do so. And you think, well, I shouldn't have to do that. That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is, oh, good, I get to do that. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph has said. And the dearth was in all the lands. Well, that's an archetypal story, right? In the archetypal story, it's the business cycle story. It's a little harsher when you're starving, obviously, but that's not the point. The point is, is that sometimes things are getting good and sometimes things are getting bad. And that's, you can be sure that that's the case. That's going to happen to you. And so the wise person takes stock of the fact that things are going to get bad. If this is the same thing that happens with Noah. It's like, assume the flood, because it's going to happen. And you think, well, it's a hell of a world that has floods. It's like, not if you have a boat. Right? It, it, it helps a lot if, you, if there's a flood and you have a boat. It's like you can float on the flood and then it's not such a problem. And so if you refuse to look at the fact that things are going to be going downhill badly and that you're going to be in a pit at some point, you and your family perhaps, then when it happens it will be as bad as it possibly can be. But if you're awake and alert to that possibility, then you can mitigate it. And the dearth was in all the lands, but in the land of Egypt, there was bread. And when the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you to do, you do that. And the famine was all over the face of the earth. And jo Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt, and all the countries came into Egypt to buy to Joseph to buy corn, because the famine was sore in all the lands. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why are you standing around looking at each other? He said, I've heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get down there and buy, from us, buy for us, so that we may live and not die. It's like pretty straightforward advice, that. And Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, so that's the youngest one, right? The only one left that's the one that was younger than Joseph, the only youngest one. And also Rachel's other son. But Je Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob didn't send because he was worried that something bad would happen to him. Which kind of indicates to me that maybe Jacob was a bit suspicious about what had happened to Joseph the last time he sent all the brothers on a adventure. And Joseph was the governor over all the land, and, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Well, there's the dream. Now, the thing is, too, is that one question you have in your life is, who should you bow down to? And you might say, no one. That's not exactly the right answer, because that means that you don't have an ideal, because you bow down to your ideal. That's what makes it an ideal. And if you don't have an ideal, then what the hell are you going to do? So you have to bow down to something. And so what happens here is, well, the brothers are bowing down to the person who's so bloody resilient and competent that they can take themselves out of a prison and become the ruler of the land. That happened to Vaclav Havel, right, in Czechoslovakia. It also happened to um, Mandela in South Africa. Like, these things actually happen. It's really something. So you, God only knows what you might learn in prison. So, so they bow down to Joseph, and properly so. You know, he's, he is, even without his coat, he's still the person 
with a coat of many colors. And Joseph saw his brothers and he knew them, but he made them so strange unto them. It's a number of years have passed. And he spoke roughly unto them and he said unto them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew whose brothers were, but they didn't know who he was. And they came back to Jacob, their father, and told him all that befell him and said, the man who's lord of the country spoke roughly to us and took us for spies. And we said to him, we're, we're true men, honest men. We're not spies. We be 12 brothers, sons of our fathers. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man said, here's how I'll know that you're honest men. Leave one of the brothers here with me and take some food for the famine of your households and be gone. And then bring your youngest brother to me. Then I'll know that you're not spies, but that you're honest men. And I'll deliver the other brother, and you shall trade in the land. So you don't have to starve to death. And it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. So they had bought food from Joseph, and he gave them the food, and then he put all their money back in their sacks, which I could imagine would worry them to some degree. And Jacob said... Me, you have already bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. Now you'll take Benjamin, Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he, and he said, No, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he's left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which you shall go, then you shall bring down my gray, gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now, there's a hint. See, what happens in the last part of the Jacob story, the Joseph story is, and this is associated with the idea of putting your house in order, your individual house in order, and then putting your family's house in order, let's say. It's reversed a little bit in this story because Joseph puts himself together and then he puts the state of, of Egypt in order, which is really quite interesting because Egypt is the canonical tyranny, right, in the Old Testament. And so the idea is, very, very clear here that the person who wears the coat of many colors can put the tyranny right. And then the next extension is, well, he has to put his family right. Now, you know, generally the progression would be put yourself right, then put your family right, then put the state right, something like that. It doesn't really, if you could do it in a different order, that's probably okay too. But, so, so that's what happens at the end of the story is that, you know, Joseph is doing pretty damn well and so is the state that he serves. But that isn't good enough for him. He wants his family to be functional and put together properly, even though they did terrible things to him. And that's very interesting, because once someone does terrible things to you, then the logical thing, or a logical thing to think is, well, go to hell in a handbasket, you know? Like, you deserve exactly what you get. But it's not a very productive attitude, especially if you're around people that you have to be around, you know, so like if it's your family and you go have a family dinner and one of you punches the other and then the other punches you back and then that's like the family dinner for the next 30 years, it doesn't seem to be very productive even if you're the person who happened to get in the last blow because you're going to have to put up with them at minimum. It might be nice to just let what you can go go and work to make, towards making things better. You have to get rid of the idea of revenge and resentment and all those things that you carry along, but... But it's probably better to think about how your family could be if it was really functioning well, and then just to aim unerringly at that. I know that's not easy. I mean, people are very screwy, and there's no end to the depths of pathology within families. But of course, this story states that very clearly. I mean... They tried to kill him. They sold him into slavery. It's, it's a pathological family. Let's put it that way. And, but Joseph's attitude is, well, we've got to set this right. Not least because of his father. But it isn't only because of his father, as you see in, as the story unfolds. And the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the corn, which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again and buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, the man did solemnly protest unto us, you, not see, you will not see my face except your brother be with you. They can't go back to Egypt without Benjamin. And they said, the man asked us straightly 
of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have you another brother? And we told him, according to the tenor of those words, Could we know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we'll arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him, if I bring him not unto thee, and set them before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. Well, so Judah, who played a pretty dismal role in the original selling Joseph into slavery, seems to obviously have learned something by this point, since he's willing to put himself on the line, you know, to take responsibility for the situation, and to put himself on the line, and to stand in for Benjamin. So he's making himself into a sacrificial object of sorts. And so, the game that Joseph's playing, because he's sort of teasing his brothers, but he's also testing them, the game that he's playing is twofold. Is one is, have you bloody well learned anything, or are you just as corrupt and useless as you were before? That's game number one. And game number two is, maybe if I poke and prod you and put you into a relatively difficult and mysterious situation, I can get you to clue the hell in, and adopt some responsibility, and we can move this whole mess forward. And so that seems to be happening. So Judah is taking responsibility, and Reuben did that as well. And the men took presents, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home and slay and make ready food, for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the men, man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the presents which was in their hand and bowed themselves again to him, to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spake? Is is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He's yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on the bread. And they sat before them. Now he plays another trick on his brother. So he has them all sit at the table, but he lines them up according to age. And so he's trying to, What is he trying to do? He's trying to freak them out, fundamentally. (laughs) And so, and he manages that because they have no idea how in the world they could possibly, he could possibly pull something like that off. They think it's magic. And the men marveled at one another. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times as much as any of theirs. So what's he doing? Well, he's testing his brothers again. The fact that when he was the child, Joseph, that he got more, meant that his brothers got terribly jealous and then murderous, right? And so now he's doing the same thing with Benjamin. He's thinking, okay, well, I'll give this kid more (coughs) than his share, (coughs) and I'll watch how these reprobates behave and see if they've learned anything. And so, and he commanded the steward of his house, saying, fill the men's sack with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in the sack as well. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And the steward did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, along with their transportation. (laughs) The the cup is found in Benjamin's sack. Well, so Benjamin's kind of young. And... Joseph sends out people to find out where the cup is gone, and they find it in Benjamin's, in Benjamin's sack. And they're very upset about this. Um, they said that a harsh punishment would befall whoever had the cup in his sack. They rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was they yet there, and they fell before him on the ground, very unhappy and apologetic. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that you have done? Ha, ha. Don't you know that A man like I can certainly divine. I know what's going on. And Judah said, what shall we say? What shall we speak? Or how can we possibly clear ourselves? God found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are your servants, both we and also 
he with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose cup, in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace to your father. It's the discovery of the cup. Judah says, now therefore when I come to the servant, thy father, my father, and the lad be not with us, and seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And the servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, if I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let me stay instead of the lad and let the lad go with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my brother and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I shall see the evil that will come on my father. Okay, so what's happened? Well, they learned their lesson. So now Judah again is willing to stand in the place of Benjamin and become a slave himself. And so now Joseph has determined that his brothers have develop their character to the point where reconciliation might be possible. You know, it says you should forgive and forget, but the conditions for that are quite, are quite specific. You know, if, you're, if you have a dispute with someone, and they've wronged you in some sense, and they apologize, the question is, well, what's the apology? Well, it's a, it's a layout of a rationale. It's something like, as far as I can tell, here's the reasons I did this horrible thing. And here's what I've learned from it. And here's what I'm going to do to try not to do it again. And would you give me another crack at it? That's the proper repentance, right? And then you forgive because you're an idiot too. And you'll probably do something stupid. And maybe you'd like the same kind of break at some point. And, and besides, if we all held each other completely to account at all possible times for everything, then... It'd just be hopeless because there'd be no room for error. So, the forgiveness which Joseph is showing is wise forgiveness. He's not going to put himself out on the line for people who haven't learned so that the same stupid thing can happen again so that they can continue to spread misery wherever they go. He's going to find out if they've clued in a little bit. And then if so, then they can move on with putting the family together. And so that breaks him up. He says, Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him. And he cried. And then he said, get every man away from me. So all the people except for Joseph's brother left. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brothers. And Joseph said, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers could not answer, for they were troubled at his presence. It's like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> understatement of the decade there. <clears throat> and Joseph said unto his brothers, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. But don't be grieved or angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. So now it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he's made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say unto him, Thus say thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me and tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And I, there I will nourish you, for yet there are five years of famine lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. So that's the other thing, that another bit of a hint. It's a bread hint here. Who's the, what's the most reliable source of bread? Well, it isn't bread itself, it's whatever it is that gives rise to bread. And that's what Joseph is in this story. He's the force that gives rise to nourishment. That's an... Joseph is often considered a type of Christ, which means like a precursor in some sense. That's, that's one way of thinking about it. And you can see that echoed right there. It's like, well, what do you store up for famine? You store up character. That's the best way through. Now, that doesn't mean you don't also store up bread. And they went out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob and told him, 
Joseph is still alive, and he's governor, and Jacob's heart fainted, for he didn't believe them. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he said to them, and when he saw all the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and came to Beersheba, and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. He said, I am God, the God of thy father. Don't fear to go to Egypt, down into Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. And so that's how the Israelites end up in Egypt. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Jacob shall put his hand upon thy eyes, thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones, and their wives, in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So the family is now all united in the proper state of being that Joseph has arranged. And they took their cattle and their goods. It's so interesting too, because of course Joseph isn't even, he's a foreigner as well as being a former slave and prisoner. Foreigner, slave and prisoner. And yet he ends up ruling Egypt. Sheer, sheerly because of the force of his character and competence. And that's really something to think about. And they took their cattle. Because that story there is that there isn't anything stronger than that. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. That there isn't a force that's more powerful than that. And, and I don't think that that's naive. In fact, I think it's the exact opposite of naive. No matter where you are, you can generally make things better if that's what you want to do. And Unless you're in, in a place that's really hell itself. Not usually is something that elevates you and elevates the people around you. And you can do that wherever you are. Because there isn't a place that's so small that you can't do that. That's the message of the prison. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt. Jacob and all his seed with them. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came unto the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went to meet Israel his father. And presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said, I can now die because I've seen your face, because you're still alive. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee, and the land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land your father and brothers can dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if they now know any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. Gives them a job. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. That's a very interesting little turn of events because you'd expect the opposite under those circumstances. So, it, it appears that Jacob was a man of relatively great self-possession. Because that's not a... You wouldn't bless Queen Elizabeth in all likelihood. <laughs> Unless you had a lot of gall. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said... I'm 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And I've not attained unto the days of the years of, my, of, my, of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed the Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If I have now found grace in, in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And Joseph said, I will do as you have said. And it came to pass, after these things, that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see your face. And lo, God hath also showed me your children. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger. 
and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands purposefully. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put the right hand upon his head. Head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He shall also become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Another repeat of the same thing that happens continually. It says when, when God wants to intervene in human affairs, what he does is invert tradition. It's something like that. And so that's a sign that, that there's something new and special going on, and that gives precedence to the younger child rather than the older child. Precedence to what is new rather than what's traditional. Of course, sometimes that's necessary because tradition is insufficient and sometimes something new has to come into being in order to update it. And Jacob called together his sons and said, Gather together so that I can tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourself together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, I'm not going to go through all 12 of these. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Now, the story is quite interesting here because Jacob blesses Joseph's sons before he blesses his own sons. And so what he's doing is placing the rights of the firstborn into the sons of his favorite son. And then he goes to his sons. And so that has implications for the way the biblical stories lay themselves out from thenceforward. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiled it. He went up to my couch. You may remember that Reuben slept with his father's concubine. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. So that painting there, what happened with Simeon and Levi was that somebody lay with their sister, Dinah, and then offered to marry her, and then, had, and then became circumcised because that was part of the deal, and then had all their men circumcised, and then Simeon and Levi went in when they were recovering and killed them all, and then... Jacob and all his people had to leave because, well, that irritated their relatives. So, <laughs> Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, thou art he whom my brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. For thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with the blessings of heavens above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the beasts, breasts, and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is it, that their father spake unto them and blessed them, everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. So that what we see here is an echo in some sense of what happens in the Mesopotamian creation story. When in the Mesopotamian creation story, there's the dragon of chaos, Tiamat, and her consort, um, Apsu. Fresh water and salt water, respectively, and they're mingled together, and, and that 
combination of chaos and order gives rise to the first assembly of the ancient gods. And then the ancient gods kill Apsu casually and foolishly and enrage Tiamat with their foolishness and ignorance and she comes back with a vengeance. In the meantime, and then she produces this huge army of monsters and puts Kingu, the worst of the monsters, at its head and then decides she's going to take out her creation. And so that's a little warning from 3,000 years ago about foolishly undermining your tradition. So, anyways, the gods in their frenzy go out and try to fight against Tai Mat and they come back with their tails between their legs continually. But then a new god appears on the scene and that's Marduk. He's got eyes all the way around his head and he can speak words of magic. And they know that there's something new about this newest god. It's his capacity for vision and his capacity for articulate speech. And so they say, well, why don't you go out and try to deal with the chaos? And Marduk says, yeah, okay, no problem, but here's the deal. You elect me top god, and now I determine the destiny of the world. And so they're desperate because, like, Tiamat is coming to get them. That's chaos with the worst of all possible monsters. They're probably thinking he's not going to win anyways. And so they agree, and out he goes, and he confronts Tiamat, who's the goddess of chaos, and he cuts her into pieces, and he makes the world out of her pieces. And one of his names is, he who makes ingenious things out of the combat with Tiamat, which is so interesting. That's such a remarkable, that's a remarkable bit of nomenclature. So who should be at the pinnacle? The force that sees and speaks and goes out to confront chaos voluntarily. You know how many years it took people to figure that out? That's like the pinnacle discovery of humanity. That's what that is. And it's echoed here. You know, you see Simeon and Levi, they're too angry. The other brothers, they all have flaws and faults of various sorts. And so they're not elevated to the highest place. But Joseph, because he has his coat of many colors and because he lands on his feet no matter where he goes and because he's not resentful and bitter and malevolent and genocidal and, and he's not shaking his fist at the sky or yelling at God because of Trump, let's say, <laughs> then he's the, he's, the right, he's the right representative of the 12 tribes. And so that's brilliant. It's a brilliant story. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his son, so it's the last thing he does to state, he knows that these are the 12 tribes that will progress into the future of this people. And now he's trying it. The last thing he does is to try to hierarchically organize their relative virtues as an indication of what has been learned. And when Jacob has made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants to, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die, in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan, and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of the of burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned unto Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up to him, and that all and all that went up with him to bury his father after he is buried, after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will now hate us and will certainly pay back to us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger saying, My father did command before he died, saying, For shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. Pretty snivelly, really. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said, 
unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So the, the idea there is that there is no evil so evil that good cannot triumph over it. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land where he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and, shall, and you shall carry my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put into a coffin in Egypt. And that's Genesis. So, So thank you all for persevering. Thank you, thank you. Well, this has been very worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. I learned an awful lot, and so, and I'm very much looking forward to continuing with it. And thank you all very much for your support and your rapt attention and your seriousness in this endeavor and your care and all of that. It's really been a privilege to be able to do this. It's a completely surreal thing to manage, and uh, so far, you know, I think about five million people have watched it, so that seems to be a very good thing, so, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask the questioners, if you've asked a question in the last three sessions, please don't ask a question today, because I'd, I never get through everyone, and so I'd like to have some questions from people that I haven't answered questions from before, if that's okay. Hi, Professor Peterson. Just a two-second thank you very much from my community and the Jewish community. So many people have been inspired you, by you to be better people, and I wouldn't be able to speak to you without saying that, so thank you very much. Um, a couple things. The, the first thing I wanted to do is make a quick comment that you might find interesting, that in the Jewish astrological calendar, um, we read the yearly cycle of the, the five books of Moses, and it just so happens that we are reading this uh, part of the, of the Torah story. So cool. I found that very interesting. That's cool. And uh, synchronistic. Yeah. Um, which brings me into a question that I wanted to ask you about, which is one question with two parts, about your knowledge of, of, of Hebrew. Um, because if you look at the Torah scrolls that you find in a synagogue, there are no vowels, there are no sentences, there are, it is, a, it is a chaos, chaos and, and order is trying to be brought into it. I'm wondering how knowledge of you, knowledgeable are you of the Hebrew, which has many layers of, of, of dimension. I'm staggeringly ignorant of it. So, you know, I, I read a lot of commentaries, right? I'm trying to zero in on the, like, with each of the phrases that we went through today, I probably looked at 10 different commentaries. And so, and then I have this underlying psychoanalytic knowledge that, it's sort of like, if you have a bunch of different templates to look at things through, and then something shines through all those templates at the same time, that's very unlikely. And so then you can, you know, a coincidence is one thing, but five coincidences, that's no longer a coincidence, that's something else. And so I think, I'm hoping that despite the fact that there's many, many things that I don't know, that there's enough things that I do know to kind of weave my way through this with some degree of utility, if not certainty. 
Yeah, because I just, which is the second part, which I guess maybe you don't know, but the, the Midrashic, the, the Jewish oral stories that date back almost as long as these stories, which fill in a lot of mind-blowingly crazy, random, and uh, so many details about these stories. And I was just wondering if you had encountered any of them before. I've encountered some of them, but again, it's, a, it's well, as you know, it's a very, very rich tradition. And so I haven't encountered enough of it. Were you thinking of anything in specific, specifically in relationship to this story? Not in particular. I actually forgot it. I was, I was intending to bring you a, a book of Midrashic stories. Well, that's a hell of a thing to say now. <laughs> well, it just, I don't know. I, I, had, I felt like I had to say that. Um, but yeah, maybe for the Exodus uh, version, I'll bring you the book. All right, all right. That would be good. Yeah, okay. Hi, Dr. Peterson. Um, I would just like to ask you to please talk about what Jung called a psychic death, also known as an ego death. Okay, say, sorry, say that again. Would you please talk about what Jung referred to as a psychic death, also called an ego death? That's what happens when someone who loves you betrays you. Right? So imagine that like, the world is complicated beyond comprehension, right? And you only see a very little bit of it. And the way you structure your understanding is you make assumptions about things. And they're simplifying assumptions. So if you trust someone, you reduce their complexity massively, right? Because, like, let's say we were married, then there's a whole bunch of ways that you're going to act that are going to be simpler. Okay, so then I can tolerate being around you in some sense because you're not everything at once. Now, those simplifying structures are hierarchically assembled, and some of them are far more important than others. Trust is one of them, especially trust in loved ones, family members, which is why betrayal by a family member is really catastrophic, because it, it, it destabilizes your past, right? All the memories you have, it destabilizes your present, it destabilizes your future, it shakes your faith in human beings, including yourself. And everything collapses, and that's an ego death. And so, now underneath the ego, as far as Jung was concerned, was another structure that he called the self. And the self is the thing that remains constant across ego deaths. But it's, it's deeper and less personal. It's archetypal. And it's the thing that the ego collapses into when it collapses, and then that rebuilds the ego. Something like that across time. But that's what an ego death is. Now, there's variants of that, because you can have a voluntary or an involuntary ego death. And a voluntary ego death is when you learn a bunch and you're willing to let go. So that would be your own immolation. It's like you're, lighting your, you're a phoenix and you're lighting yourself on fire. That's a much better idea, even though it can still be really harsh. The involuntary ego deaths, they're really hard on people. People will do almost anything to stop that from happening, which is partly why they fight to maintain their group-fostered axiomatic simplifications. It's not surprising, because it's very, you lose your, like that ego death is a journey into the underworld, or it's a collapse into chaos. And that's not so bad if you do it purposefully. But in the Pinocchio story, for example, that's exemplified by Pinocchio going down to the depths to rescue his father from the whale. Now, he does that voluntarily, but it damn near kills him, right? I mean, first of all, he hardly gets out of the whale. Second, he actually drowns and dies, but he comes back to life. So even if you do it voluntarily, it's still... Well, it's just better than doing it involuntarily, which is the other alternative. So that's what it is. You bet. Hello, Dr. Peterson. Uh, so I've been listening to, back to all of these biblical lectures for the second time now. And um, I wanted to show you an observation I came upon, because I was trying to find a question that you haven't been asked before, which is harder than doing my Ryerson exams, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, so I've noticed, I think you're getting funnier. Oh, yes. Oh, no, I think Michael Corrin said that this week, I think. But the word he used was bizarre, I think. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm feeling better. So that's, I actually have a sense of humor. It's, it's hard to believe that. But, so it sort of comes back when I'm not feeling like I'm going to die at any moment. So. Yeah, I, I've basically noticed, one, you're making more attempts at jokes. So that's great. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Two, those jokes are landing more often, oh, right? <laughs> but then there's this third element, which I think was what Steve Martin quit because of, which is 
that I think the audience is anticipating jokes more, and they're actually, you know, I've noticed people laughing more at things that aren't intending to be jokes. So I was just wondering what you make of that, and um, they're intended. I'm hoping they're intended. Just because I keep a straight face doesn't mean they're not intended to be jokes. So, yeah. No, it's good. Look, one of the things is like it's, and I've tried to keep this. I I learned a while ago, probably about five years ago, that even when you're dealing with really serious matters, that if you're not handling it with a light touch, you're not an expert at it. You're not a master at it. And you think, well, there are some things that are so deep and dark that you can't handle them with a light touch. And that's actually not true. You can... That doesn't mean you make light of them. It doesn't mean anything like that. It's that you don't... It's minimal necessary force. It's something like that. You don't hit it any harder than you have to. And it's, a, it's an art when you're discussing serious matters. And so, well, one of the upshots of that is that because we're discussing serious matters and because serious matters are being discussed in the culture at large right now, it would be really good if everybody could keep their sense of humor. You know, and I see positive signs of that. Like, there's a lot of satirical activity on the net, you know. And that could easily catalyze into horror mob. But it isn't. It is, it is you know, that that's happening to some degree. But a lot of it's satire and comedy. And as long as we can keep a sense of humor about this, then I think, well, we're not as close to disaster as we might be. And so, one, one of the things that I have found rather ominous is that there are comedians, first of all, being persecuted for under free speech restriction legislation, which I think is absolutely appalling, but also that there are comedians now who won't perform on university campuses. John Cleese won't. Um, Seinfeld, that's like, well, you know how offensive he is. It's no wonder that, I mean, he's, he's like the straightest, nicest comedian you could possibly imagine. He won't perform on college campuses. I think Louis C.K. won't perform on, or, or anywhere else. For, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a bad sign. But no, humor, humor is, is good. And it's interesting because I've been kind of watching how I'm represented on the web, weirdly enough. And there's all these memes that have emerged. I don't know, thousands of the bloody things. And um, most of them are comical. And that's good. Like, people are... are, are they're, they're, whatever it is that they're doing, I don't know what the hell it is, but it's being done with a relatively light touch, and that's really, really good. That's how it should be. You've got to have a sense of humor. I mean, it's one of the things that makes life bearable, so, or maybe even better than bearable. So, you. you bet. Hello, Dr. Peterson. just want to say um, uh, what a great lecture uh, series, and... Uh, this is the last in this year, so uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say this. this Don't morning. get too enthusiastic about that. <laughs> I wrote you an essay of a question, and then I used the, uh, the, lecture, or the essay writing guide on Psych 230 to uh, narrow it down to just a few pages, uh, a few lines, and then during this, uh, this particular lecture, like the zigzag slide manifest again, and I thought, oh, I basically just had all my questions answered. So um, basically, I just I, I want to ask um, the idea of uh, you're, you've made a lecture that was um, on YouTube many years ago, and uh, you keep referring to Cain and Abel and the, uh, the death of Abel by Cain and the curse, and I, and I think... Well, that that was a um, that was a single bro two brothers conflicting, um, but but here we have in the uh, the sons of Jacob the twelve. There was one who was one who was good, one who was an able archetype, and there were 12, uh, eleven that came after him. So uh, that I don't know. Maybe there's something about the division. Or, uh, oh, that's a good observation. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, th there's a bit of variability because Reuben, and Reuben isn't quite as bad as the rest. But yeah, I would say it's probably easier for the Cain side to multiply. Luckily, it's not as powerful. Because it doesn't do anything. Like it, it, it... Yes, yes. And, you know, you, there's, Jung was often included, accused of Manichaeanism. I'm not pronouncing that properly. But there was a, there was a variant of Christian dogma that held that good and evil were separate metaphysical realities and that they were battling for the for 
governance of the cosmos, something like that. But they both had an independent existence. And the classical Christian idea, which won out over that, was that no, that good was real, but evil was the absence of good. Now, that produced all sorts of... The absence of good produces all sorts of consequences. And it is interesting to read Jung, because he does get kind of Manichaean in his discussions. And I I think it was partly because he was so concerned about what happened in Nazi Germany and then with... uh, Cold War afterwards, you know, because evil seemed to be a palpable force. But I don't think that it's as powerful as good. And, but I do think it's easier for it to multiply because it's, well, it's easier path. It's easy to be resentful and hostile and bitter and, and do nothing. That's easy. It's horrible and it's hard on people, but it doesn't require a tremendous amount of faith or effort. So maybe that is why it's multiplied in the final story in Genesis. Yeah, and I, I've been reading ahead and, uh, for my own, based on uh, the interest of, of uh, the present, presented stories. And I, I uh, keyed in on a few other books um, and chapters in the Bible, like uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. Um, and that cycles through the idea of I can have all things in life, uh, knowledge, power, but it's all passing. And uh, uh, the la- uh, now and forever are ho- faith, hope, and love. And then, of course, love triumphs overall. Yeah, well, the love issue, see, I've, I've been, th- I thought a lot about the relationship between love and truth because I've thought and talked a lot more about truth. And I think partly that's because love is a word that you can hardly even say because it's been so, it's like it's been dragged behind a car through mud puddles. It's something like that. But, so, sorry, let me just finish elaborating this idea. But I think that the, the, the love idea is associated with for me, at least, with what I discussed at the beginning of this lecture with regards to faith, I think you have to make a decision about what your attitude towards being is going to be. And the proper attitude, in my estimation, is that you're working for its betterment. You know, and so maybe, maybe you have the same attitude towards being as you do towards someone that you love, like a son or a daughter or a wife, that you want things to be better. And then, so that's your aim. So the aim is basically, the aim is motivated by love. You want things to be better. Because I think that's a good definition of love. Like, if you really care for someone, you can tell because you want things to be better for them. And then I think truth is nested inside that because I think that truth is the best servant of love. It's something like that. Um, So... I've been struggling with an idea recently that I was thinking maybe you'd be able to help me out with. Basically, in a recent interview, you talked about how myth is meant to reconcile inherent contradictions in reality, right? But I'm sort of stuck between two mythological or um, psychoanalytic ideas that I think are both really important, but they seem to have an inherent contradiction within them that I've been trying to figure out. So on one hand, you have this idea that There's times in your life where you have to identify things in yourself that are insufficient or there's a problem somehow that you have to kind of have a controlled burn or like a phoenix-like transformation where you discard part of yourself that doesn't fit or is not working. But then on the other hand, you have talked about this, this Jungian idea where as you become really, when you get older, you mature by reincorporating things about yourself that you lost when you were younger or that you know, you're trying to integrate your shadow, or you're trying to find parts of your personality that, that maybe you've been rejecting and try and figure out how to bring them into, into the fold or into mm-hmm. the whole. So he's got this quote that I really like, which is, I'd rather be whole than good. Right, right. So, so on one hand, you may identify something as a problem and you want to get rid of it or burn it off. But then on the other hand, it seems like the, the path to being stronger is to figure out how to put everything together. So there's a, there's a, one of the things Jung wrote about in his works on alchemy was um, an explanation of the prime alchemical dictum, which was solve coagula, which meant dissolve and integrate. Right, so, so imagine this, so imagine that, imagine you had a fairly hostile father who was not very well controlled in his aggression. Decent person other than that, but let's say that. And so your reaction is, I'm never going to be aggressive. And so you've built a, like a moral structure 
That's part of your personality. And there's possibility floating around outside of that that you you've denied an ethical, you've denied any ethical. What would you say? You've stripped the idea of aggression of any ethical utility whatsoever. Okay, so what happens? This burns off, and then that comes back up. Now you still have to integrate it. So it's associated in some sense with Nietzsche's idea as morality as cowardice. Because one of Nietzsche's most trenchant critiques of traditional morality, let's say, is that most of what passes for morality isn't morality. It's just cowardice. It's not that I'm a good person and I don't hurt you. It's that I'm afraid to hurt you. And because I don't want to admit that I'm afraid to hurt you, then I say I'm moral because then I can mask my essential fear and cowardice in a guise of morality. And that happens far more often than you would think because harmless and moral are by no means the same thing. So some of what you're burning off, you can sit, and this is where Freud was such a genius, I think, is because he concentrated on aggression and sexuality, which are perhaps the two most difficult parts of a personality to integrate. He said that um, the, the hyper-simplified morality stops you from tapping into deeper recesses of your psyche. And it's partly because they're primal forces. It's not surprising that you don't want to have anything to do with them, that you stay away from situations where they might make themselves manifest. But the problem is, by denying the worst in yourself in that manner, suppressing it, you preclude the possibility of the best. Because no one can be a good person without integrating their capacity for aggression. Because without that capacity for aggression, you cannot say no. Because no means, if you really say it, no means there isn't anything that you can do to me that will make me change my mind. Or, or conversely, it means I will play for higher stakes than you will. And unless you've got your aggression integrated, there isn't a chance you can say that. And if you did, no one would take you seriously. Because they'd know it was just a show. So... One of the most useful things that Jung did, I think, was to work on this idea of the integration of the shadow, because he was really interested in the idea of evil, right? Especially working with trying to parcel out what happened in Nazi Germany and during the Second World War. What do you do with the part of you that's aggressive and, and potentially malevolent? Do you just crush it? That's the superego response in some sense. Do you just put it behind you, so to speak? Is that a possibility? Or do you admit to its existence and bring it into the game? And that's See, for, for Freud, in some sense, morality was superego clamping down on the id. And they were fundamentally opposed. Both Jung and Piaget had a different idea, and I think they were right. It's like, no, no, you invite the bad guys out to play. And so you're an aggressive hockey player. But it's disciplined aggression. That makes you, gives you access to a whole sorts of energy you wouldn't otherwise have. And then with regards to sexuality, it's like, well, untrammeled promiscuity doesn't constitute a virtue, but neither does unavoidable virginity, right? In fact, I think that's worse because it also masks itself with virtue. It's like, well, you should be able to, you should be able to do things that you wouldn't do. That's, the, that's like the definition of a genuinely moral person. They could do it, but they don't. And that, that's not cowardice. And so that's, you burn off the things that get in the way of that integration. So when you say dissolve and integrate, might yep. it be a good way to sort of bring the two ideas together that the burning off and the difficult process is necessary because the elements of yourself are structured together in a rigid way that is not working properly. And the yeah, that's what happens to Geppetto in the belly of the whale. He's so caught in his presuppositions that he can't escape, right? And so Pinocchio represents the new force. So it's very interesting. So when you watch Pinocchio try to rescue him, the first thing Geppetto does is confuse Pinocchio with a fish because he wants something to eat. But Pinocchio is better than something to eat because he can rescue him so he doesn't need to eat. And then Pinocchio wants to make a fire and Geppetto objects because he's going to burn up all the furniture. It's like, we don't need the damn furniture if we're getting out of the whale, you know? And so, so Geppetto, and, and he's old, so that, that, that's, the rigid, that's the rigid structure. That's the old year that has to die off before the new year can be born. It's a forest fire that allows for new growth, and, and that's how those things are, are put together. 
And see, and it's useful to know too, because if you burn something off, you might think, well, there's nothing left. It's like, that's not true. If it's dead wood, then you have room for new growth. And you want to be doing that on a fairly regular basis. That's the, that's, that's the snake that sheds its skin and transforms itself, right? That's, that's the death and resurrection from a psychological perspective. It's exactly the same idea. Now, we don't know the upper limit to that, right? Because we don't know what a person would be like if they let everything that they could let go, let go. And only let in what was seemly, let's say. But you can see that. It's funny. We don't know that to some degree. You can see people very... You can see people start to do that without... That's not a rare experience. And people improve very rapidly. They can improve their lives very rapidly. A lot of it's low-hanging fruit. Like, if you just stop doing really stupid things that you know are stupid, your life improves a lot. So, and it, it frees you up. It also means there's, a, there's an element there that's also associated with pride. Because people tend to take pride in who they are. And that's a bad idea because that stops you from becoming who you could be. Because if you're proud of who you are, you won't let that go when it's necessary. You won't step away from it. You know, and then you end up being your own parody, something like that. That's also a very bad idea. You want to be continually stepping away from your previous self. And so, be, and I guess part of that too is that you, you have to decide, you know, are you, are you order? Are you chaos? Or are you the process that mediates between them? And if you're the process that mediates between them, you, you are the thing that transforms. And that's the right attitude for a human being, because that's what we are. We're the thing that voluntarily confronts chaos and transforms. That's what we are. And so for better or worse, you know, that's our deepest biological essence, you might say. And so you can let things go if you know that there's more growth to come. So... One more. Thank you for your time, and thank you for spending your time with all of us. Hey, my pleasure. It's been a pleasure. So, if I could, since we are at the end of Genesis, I'd like the opportunity to challenge, or at least have you take another look at your position uh, you've held with regards to Cain's reflection on the murder of Abel. Uh, I bring this up because it's actually a part of Genesis that has bothered me for a while, and it's not, like, because it's not as straightforward as it's presented usually, and it's very... I've been wrestling with it. So in this series, as well as in a couple of your uh, Maps of Meaning lectures, you summarized it something to the effect of Cain coming to the conclusion that what he did leads to a punishment which is more than he believes he can face, um, which I believe to be born out of a natural reading of specific translation choices incorrectly made, or in, sorry, uh, innocently made by editors just for readability's sake. So in Genesis 4.13, Cain does not say, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He actually says, my sin is greater than I can bear. Which is to say, oh, yeah. which is to say it's not his past actions. Uh, which is to say it's not his past actions, it's his future consequences. Which, uh, he, it's his past actions, not his future consequences, which he regrets. For him to say, alone, iniquity or sin, that is for, too much for him to bear is a reflection on the reality of his corruption and not a plea of mercy to the deity to spare him. Okay, well, that's, that seems to be a deeper interpretation, I would say. And I think it's more, that's the same line of reasoning that Dostoevsky pursued in Crime and Punishment, right? Because in Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov gets away with murder and then he cannot stand it. He cannot stand that he did it because he's no longer the same person. But even more, he cannot stand that he got away with it. So that's more in keeping with, uh, with that interpretation. So uh, This also is reflected in the following verse in 4.14 where he states the consequences of his actions, mainly that God's presence will ha be hidden from him and that he will be killed. The verse opens with the word hain, which means indeed, more or less, and denotes a sense of acceptance and not a complaint. It is mm -hmm. the difference between saying, oh no, will God now hide his face from me and will I be hunted versus, of course, God will hide his face from me and I will be hunted and killed, uh -huh. which I've been wrestling with and um, have taken away to possibly mean that there are sins that we can do that uh, will just push us too far. Well, okay, there, there, there are, well, okay. So one of the, well, one of the things that you see 
in post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder situations, for example, is that people view themselves doing something so terrible, they don't know how to put it right. So that, and so you could say under those circumstances, the face of God is hidden from them because they cannot, they cannot atone for it. They cannot reconcile themselves to it. It's there all the time. And they can't see anything good beyond it. It's hell, essentially. And so, I mean, sometimes when you're working with people with post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, you, you kind of in, initiate them into a philosophy of good and evil so that they can see when... Joseph talks to his brothers, and they've got all this guilt, right? And, and he doesn't want them to have more guilt than necessary to fix themselves, because it, it just burdens them otherwise. He says, look, don't forget, yeah, yeah, it was you, but it's also God's doing. And I had a client once who, who had obsessive-compulsive disorder, and um, he was a very smart guy. He also happened to work in a radioactive lab that had a lot of radioactive materials, which wasn't the best place for someone with OCD. And... Uh, he was worried that he would make some mistake, and this is very common with OCD, that would result in someone suffering, which you will, you'll, you'll do that. And it wasn't until I could get him to conceptualize himself and his life in part as a force of nature that he was able to reconcile himself to the possibility that an error on his part would produce catastrophic consequences. But people often find themselves in situations where they just... They cannot reconcile themselves to what they've done. And that it makes sense to me that, that the interpretation that you're describing, that, that, makes, that makes plenty of sense from a psychological perspective. So there, are, there are sins that will push us to like just beyond our limits that are too far. But there are also no consequences to our actions that are devoid of a truth we can accept and learn from. And this is what I've kind of delved out of this uh, bit with Cain and Abel. So if this is the case... Why then does it take us so long and with so much self-denial before we accept personal responsibility when faced with tragedy, especially when it's self-inflicted? Well, I, I don't think you want to underestimate the, the contribution of just sheer difficulty. Like, you know, let's say you, 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 you're grieving because someone close to you died. It's like, well, it isn't just that you've lost them although that's a big part of it, it's that you have to rebuild yourself. And it's really hard to do that. So, and, and it's sort of proportional to the significance of your error. So if you commit an error, and then you recognize that it's an error, if it's a sort of surface error, it's like, well, you can just touch up the paint. But sometimes the whole understructure is just rotten. And then you don't know what to do. And then, so that's one problem. It's just sheer bloody difficulty. And I see this with people very often. It's like they're at a point in their divorce, let's say, and they don't know what to do. They cannot solve the problem. It's too complicated. They just don't have the resources. And maybe they've squandered some of their resources as well, but sometimes they just don't have the resources. And then if you add to that error and sin and malevolence and blindness and all those other things, people... There's a guy named Thomas Saz who wrote this really interesting article in the 1960s, a book actually called The Myth of Mental Illness. And uh, it was classic reading for clinical psychologists when I was training. And the reason for that was is that Saz pointed out, and this is true, is that <clears throat> lots of times if you're a psychotherapist, people don't come to you because they have mental illnesses. They come to you because they have insoluble problems in their life. You know, like maybe they've had a, two-year affair at work, their wife is alcoholic, and they have a very, and their father has Alzheimer's disease. It's like, they just don't know what to do. It's too much. Now, you know, they shouldn't have had the affair, so there's a moral issue. And maybe they should have intervened in the alcoholism in the family. Maybe they used their wife's alcoholism as an excuse to have the affair. You know, like, these things get very tangled. It's just, it's so bloody complicated that people can't untangle it. So, and I would say that's in keeping with the interpretation that you laid forth with regards to Cain is, it sounds like it's one, one of the reasons why it's so useful to read multiple translations, right? Because nuances matter. It sounds to me from that description that he actually woke up at least briefly and noticed what he did and said, there's no coming back from this. And, and it is, you can easily get places 
that you do not know how to come back from. Now, you know, they say, well, all things are possible with God, and there's always the possibility of redemption, no matter how serious the sin. But I'll tell you, sometimes people have no idea how to get back from where they went. Well, and you can understand often why people wouldn't do that, right? Yeah, well, that's a funny thing, because one of the things Carl Rogers said, too, about psychotherapy is that you can't do psychotherapy with someone who hasn't recognized that they have a problem. So the, it's a massive thing to recognize that you have a problem, and it does open the door, perhaps, to recovery. But it also means that you've recognized that you have a problem, and that can be very, very... It's the desert, right? You're out of the tyranny, but you're in the desert, and the sun's beating down on you, and there's no necessary reason to presume that you're going to survive. So... Thank you. Have a good night, and stay yeah. warm. Thank you all. If you found this conversation meaningful, you might consider picking up Dad's books, Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief, or his newer bestseller, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Both of these works delve much deeper into the topics covered in the Jordan B. Peterson podcast. See jordanbpeterson.com for audio, ebook, and text links, or pick up the books at your favorite bookseller. Remember to check out jordanbpeterson.com slash personality for information on his new course. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please let a friend know or leave a review. Talk to you next week. Follow me on my YouTube channel, Jordan B. Peterson, on Twitter, at Jordan B. Peterson, on Facebook, at Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, and at Instagram, at jordan.b.peterson. Details on this show, access to my blog, information about my tour dates and other events, and my list of recommended books,